Hey everybody, welcome back. And if this is your first time joining us, we especially want to welcome you. We're so glad to have you as part of the Grace Honolulu Church Online family this weekend. You know, around here we like to say that everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect. And with God, anything is possible. We believe that God has the power to change your life. And I really pray that you experience that touch of the amazing power of God today. And if you haven't already done so, please text connect to the number on your screen. This is our way to keep you informed as to what's coming up in our church and how to connect you with the life of our church. Now at this time, our worship team is gonna lead us in worship. We're gonna sing some songs, quiet our heart, and invite the presence and power of God. Let's worship. Welcome Grace Honolulu. I know that we're in a season where it looks like we're surrounded by giants. A giant pandemic, a giant economic struggle, a giant of fear, anxiety, depression. But today, let's lean into the one that has conquered every giant that has ever stood in front of God's people. We've talked a lot about what worship is, but did you know that worship can also be used as a battle cry? So today, let's cry out to God and sing songs of praise, for He is the one who fights on our behalf. Amen? As Caleb said, let's go.
Wait. 
the King of Majesty. And we thank you for being that promise keeper, for being our way maker. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and not on the giants in our lives because those giants and the darkness that fills this world, they tremble at the sound of your name. Amen. Aloha everyone, and I pray that as we worshiped our Father together, that your homes were filled with his peace and his joy and his hope. You know, last week, Pastor Greg shared about Joshua and Caleb and their report on the promised land. And as I thought about it more this week, what stood out to me was that they would probably have shared that same report standing alone, but that together, standing side by side, how much better it was to be able to focus on God's promises and not the giants that surrounded it. And as I read Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, 
I saw that we were given an outline, how we can do this together, standing together in community. The passage gives us three things that we can do. The first is to cling tightly to God and His promises because He is faithful. The second is to encourage one another to continue to show God's love and kindness to others. And the third is for us to live life together in community. You know, throughout this past year, there have been so many ups and downs. And one of the constant things in my life has been the love and the support and encouragement and prayers of the ladies in my grace group. While I may not have an earthly sister, I have sisters in Christ who are willing to stand beside me and to encourage me to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. So if you're not a part of a grace group yet, I want to encourage you to text the word group to the number on your screen. Because when we live life together, it is so much better and it's so much easier for us to live lives for God wholeheartedly. Now, as we prepare our hearts to give back to our Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you all for your continued faithfulness and giving during this time. Our choice to give our first fruits back to our Father really honors Him and all that He has done for us. And together we will shine our lights brightly for Jesus and we will share the good news of God's peace to others. The easiest way to give is by texting GRACE808 to the number on your screen. And we thank you to those who have already given. Let's pray together, family. Father, we thank you for your steadfast love and your heart, your desire to partner with us in creating a place where everyone is welcome because nobody is perfect and where with you, anything is possible. Please use our humble gifts Multiply them greatly so that our light will shine brightly in this community and throughout the world. Amen. Hello, Grace Honolulu family and guests. We're glad you're joining with us online. And I just want to start by thanking God for rerouting Hurricane Douglas. How many of you, you, you know that was a miracle, right? In fact, we all thought it was a miracle when the hurricane was headed directly toward the islands. And, and, and we do this weird thing when the prayer is answered and God actually does something like that. We begin to walk back our faith and then say, well, it was this or that or the other. You know what? It was a miracle of God's mercy and goodness that rerouted that hurricane away from the island. So let's just take a moment to thank him together. God, we, we just, we thank you. We thank you that you wanted to show your goodness and your mercy to us in this way. And we thank you that you rerouted that hurricane away from the islands, away from harm, and that you spared life and spared harm. We're grateful for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And what, a, what an amazing God we serve. I want to encourage you as uh, COVID begins to kick up around the world uh, and we're making our comeback. It, it seems sometimes that we take a couple steps forward and then a few steps back and then fear tries to invade our lives. I want to encourage you not to let fear drive your lives. I want to encourage you to do everything that you need to do to embrace the reality that we're living in right now, to be responsible, to wear your mask, wash your hands and watch your distance. But I also want to encourage you not to let fear drive your reactions or responses to things. Don't let it happen. Here's what I ask myself uh, on most days when I wake up so that I don't allow fear to drive me, but I allow my faith to drive me. Here's what I ask myself. What do I know for sure? What do you know for sure? Here's what I know for sure. I know that our God is sovereign which means that He is ruling over creation, over all of creation, even in the moments and places where it doesn't seem like it or I can't see it. I know that He holds all things in the palm of His hands. I know that our God is not only strong, but that His love for us, His creation, it is intense. It is strong. I know that because God sent His Son, Jesus, into our world to die on a cross in our place to pay the price for our sins. That's how God demonstrated the strength of His love for you and I. Now, let me ask you this question. If he did that for you and I, while we were his enemies, while we were sinners, while we were helpless, Christ did that for you and I, how much more now that we're his children, will he not provide everything that you and I need? His love for you, his love for his creation, it is strong. And I know that God is working in all things for his greater purposes and for your greater good. I know that he's doing that. Even if we can't understand it in the moment, we trust that. And one of the things that he's doing is he's producing in you and I this beautiful quality of humility. Humility, it's powerful. And last week we talked about this. I know that the promises, the good things of God, they're protected by problems. 
adversity, obstacles. We talked about the giants last week. Sometimes it's just the severe and overwhelming reality. But instead of caving to fear, I also know some other things. I know that God has a plan. I know that nothing can thwart God's plan. And I know that He always provides for His plan. So even though the plan is going to take a fight, God is building something in that process of fighting. And I know this. I know that God wants me in this moment to strengthen my foundations, to go deeper in Him and in His Word so that I'm prepared in a greater way to take hold of His promise and to overcome the problems. I know that. Today, I want to talk about the church. I, I got a confession to make. I love the church with a capital C, and I love our church with a little c. And I'm not sure what comes to your mind or even to your heart, to your emotions, what you feel when you hear the word church. I'm guessing it was probably not the same thing that the early followers of Christ had in mind. It's not the same thing that they experienced. Uh, for many of us, I think it's a different thing. So I want to look at the church. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that when God launched the church, He did not have safe in mind. I don't think He did. Now, I don't think He did because our God is not safe. Even though we, we want Him to be safe and controllable, our God is not safe. There, there's a, a moment in a series of books called The Chronicles of Narnia, and the first book in the series is one called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And the Chronicles of Narnia are a fictional tale that basically mirror the gospel, mirror the Bible, mirror the scriptures, and talk about this lion king named Aslan. Aslan is sim symbolic of Jesus and what Jesus does. And one of, the, one of the early persons who's being introduced to Aslan, her name is Lucy. And Lucy wants to know, because she hears he's a lion, is he safe? Is he safe? And she's talking to a beaver character. I know it's, it's fictional. She's talking to a beaver character, and the character kind of scoffs and says, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's a king. There's a certain thing fear of God and fear of the king that we're supposed to have. And he's not safe. Our king is not safe. But we can be assured that he's good. He may not be safe, but he's good. And one of the things I think that's happening during this whole COVID season is as there is danger around us and the temptation for you and I, it's to shrink back, it's to shrink our God down, and it's to play it safe which makes it really hard to be a follower of Christ because our king is not safe. And to follow him means stepping out of safety into this dangerous, into this good space. So if your primary value is safety, it's going to be really hard to follow Jesus. It's going to be really hard to follow God because safety is not his highest value. He's good and he's got a purpose. God isn't safe and I don't believe he ever intended for his church to be safe. We could be a group of people whose primary value is safety and just not disrupting the status quo and kind of being good and staying to ourselves and not taking too many risks. But I don't think we'd be the church at that point. But here's what the church has done as a dangerous church. In 30, uh, 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who weren't able to care for themselves. In 369 A.D., throughout history, the church has been the first to stand up for the rights of children, creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. I don't know if you knew this, but 100 of the 110 universities in America, they were founded as Christian institutions to train people to live in the fear of and in relationship with God. Places where maybe you went to school, you know somebody went to school at Harvard, Dartmouth, Princeton, Yale, those different universities were founded as institutions to train people to be followers of Christ. Today, much of the world's art and architecture and literature and music has been shaped by the church. And today, the church brings fresh food and water to millions around the world, cares for widows and orphans, and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. And you'll find this as well, stands as first responders to most of the crisis and disaster around the world. All of that, that is not safe. But that has been the history, the pattern, and the legacy of the church. So when you think of the word church, what thoughts, what words come to your mind? For the first people, for the first followers, for the early church in the first century, the church was a movement. And the church is today 
It is a movement. It didn't begin as an institution with an organized liturgy or order of service or any of those things. It didn't begin with bands and lights and, and music and all the things that we typically associate church with today. It didn't begin with the staff or a hierarchy or anything like that. The church began as a movement. It was a movement of people who risked their lives. Many of them ended up giving their lives for a single event that they believed in history. Now watch this. The thing that gathered people and that launched the church was a single event in history. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the early followers, they went on mission to take this message that Jesus is the resurrected Savior of the world. They went on mission to take this message to the entire world. So the church was birthed around a single event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it was this simple message that Jesus is the Savior of the world and this simple mission of taking this message to the entire world. The church was launched as a movement. And it is today still moving. If you're part of Grace Honolulu or another church, you're part of this movement. And I want to look at the first place where the, the actual word or idea of church is used. It's in Matthew 16. And here's where we find the first reference to church in the New Testament. Uh, and let me just give you a little context of what's happening. Jesus is basically asking his followers who people think he is. And what, what's the word on the street about me? Who do people say that I am? And his followers come back and they say, well, some people think that you're the reincarnated, um, you know, John the Baptist. Or some people think that you're the reincarnated Elijah. And then he makes it real personal. He says, and this is a good question for you to consider. Who do you say that I am? Man, I think that question is probably the most important question that all of us should consider in our lifetime. Who do you say that I am? And then Peter, as the representative of the group, he says, well, I think that you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes on. Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. In other words, you didn't just think your way and add everything up and come to this conclusion. God revealed this to you. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And then he says this, And I tell you the truth, Peter. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or the gates of Hades will not overcome it. On this rock, Peter, on this message, Peter, on this revelation that you've had that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, on this message that He is the Savior of the world, I will build my church. And when he said church, he didn't think of it as a building or location because really there were no church buildings. There was the temple, but there were no church buildings. Jesus uses a word Ecclesia, which has now been translated church. But really that word ecclesia, more appropriately translated, is a gathering. It's an assembly. It's a congregation. So Jesus is saying, on this message, I'm building my people who are congregating and who are moving into the earth. I'm building my movement. It describes more than a place or a building. It describes a people who are gathered and who are going on mission to take this simple message that Jesus is the Savior of the world into all the world. We don't just go to Ecclesia. Jesus, when he said it, he had this in mind. We are Ecclesia. We don't just go to it. We are it. And he says this, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, people will come and people will go and it doesn't matter who dies or how many, it will continue. The movement will continue and continue and continue because the movement is based on a people who are gathered and who are going. They're gathered around this single event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they are perpetually going with this simple message that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He is the Savior of the world. And they are going with this message on a simple mission to take this message and be witnesses of it into all the world. The church is a movement. It was birthed as a movement and it continues to be a movement today because, well, movements continue to move. Not long after this moment, Jesus was crucified, was put to death. 
And then he rose from the dead and he spent about 40 days with his followers. There were probably about 100, 120 of them that were typically gathered around them. And one day on a hillside, he gave them his final instructions. In Matthew 28, it sounds something like this. He says, therefore, I want you to now go and I want you to make disciples of all the nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them everything that I've commanded you. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I will be with you in this mission even to the ends of the earth. Now, in the book of Acts, he says it a different way, but he says kind of the same thing and gives them their marching instructions, and he predicts the beginning of the church. And as he does this, he has already told them this simple message that he wants them to take, that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of the living God, that he is the Savior of the world. And so he's going to launch his church with this message, and before he goes to send them on mission, he gathers up the twelve, and this is what he tells them in Acts 1. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the epics or the dates that the Father has set by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So He tells them that they're going to receive power. They're going to receive power by the Holy Spirit. And that power is for something. And here's what the power is for. Power is is so that they can be witnesses, so that they can go and they can proclaim or testify to something that they've seen, so they can accurately represent this event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so they can represent what Jesus did and who He was. And God says, you're going to go in my power and you're going to take this message into all the world and the presence of God is going to spill into all the world as you go with this life-changing message. So imagine, imagine standing there with Jesus and the other about 100 to 120 followers that were gathered there. And they're standing there with Jesus just weeks after Rome had crucified him, just weeks after the religious leaders have rejected him. And Jesus tells them, you're going to take my teaching and the fact that you are eyewitnesses of the resurrection. You're going to take this message to Jerusalem. You're going to take it to Judea, Samaria, and even to the rest of the world. What? You kidding me? And by the power of God, this movement has touched the rest of the world. This is exactly what happened. This is exactly what you and I are a part of today. We're a part of this movement that was birthed in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. And so as the story goes on in Acts 2, they were told to wait until God's presence by the Holy Spirit had come to them. And they were in a room. They were in a place together. It says this, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later with my friend Clifton. They were all together in one place. And a couple weeks after Jesus had told them his final instructions, something amazing happens. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And God does this amazing thing. They were gathered together in this upper room. They spill out into the streets and they spill out into the streets speaking languages of the people who were gathered in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. And they were hearing them proclaim. They were hearing these uneducated uh, fishermen from Galilee proclaiming the works of God in other languages. And they began to say, well, what the heck is going on? And this was a demonstration of the Spirit of God who had shown up in their midst, just as Jesus had, protect, had predicted to birth not just a building, but a movement. And as the story goes on and they begin to question them, the disciples begin to speak up and say, this is evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit. And they begin to spill out into every place and location. And again, the people were going, well, these are just uneducated men. How do we hear them speaking in not just a language, but in all these different languages? Because this movement was being birthed as a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multinational movement this was the day, think about this, this is the day that the church was born. It wasn't a ribbon-cutting ceremony to dedicate a building. It was the followers of God moving into the city, moving into the community and the power of God to bring the presence and the message and the fact that they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ into the community. It was just as Jesus had predicted it. It happened just as he had said, it was going to be an ecclesia, a gathering, an assembly, a congregation on the move. And this is what the church is always meant to be. 
It's always meant to be a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multiplying, mission-centered movement of people going and taking this simple message into all the world. And I've invited my friend Clifton to come and share with us. Clifton is part of our board at Grace Honolulu because I believe our next step as a church is to find a place, is to find a location for grace in which we can gather, in which we can grow, and through which we can go to the community and continue to be the church that is on the move. This is my friend Clifton. Here we are at Clifton Yasutomi's office. Clifton, thanks for having us here. Sure. And we've been talking about the fact that the church, when Jesus launched the church, he launched it as a movement. It was a movement of people who were gathered to go and take this good news about Jesus Christ into the world. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, as Grace Honolulu, we believe that our next steps into continuing to be this multiplying, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational movement the next step for us is to find a location, a location mm -hmm. that we can gather in, that we can grow in, and from which we can go. Mm -hmm. And as we've been talking about this, there's a scripture that's been kind of banging around in your, in your heart a little bit. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so a scripture that I came across and I thought applied to what we've been talking about is back from Acts 2. And so Acts 2 says, on the day of Pentecost, on the day that God's Spirit dropped down and empowered the disciples, all the believers were meeting together in one place. That. So that was the setting of the day of Pentecost when God came with his power. And then later on in that same chapter, the last paragraph says, and again, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And that's when they went ahead and they shared everything they had. They met the needs of the people. They worshiped together at the temple daily. They met in homes. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of the people and God added to their numbers, got added to their fellowship yeah. daily. That's yeah. good. That's good. I love that as you're, as you're writing that. I love the fact that this place was a place where they gathered together. It was a place where they grew together. And it was a place from which they ended up going out into the surrounding community. It wasn't just gathering and hiding out. It was actually gathering to grow and then eventually go. Uh, and there is a, there is a powerful... A connection with location. Location gives us the opportunity to be able to do that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's one of the key words, I think, in this phrase. When I look at it, I see three key words, in fact. The first is believers. Yeah. The believers were the people that embraced the gospel. Then the second word is the togetherness, when the people were together. Um, but they were able to be together because uh, they're in one place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were gathered together in one place. They were waiting for God to do what He promised to do. And in that meantime, they were worshiping God. They were not only worshiping God, but they were growing and becoming a people where God's presence could dwell. And then, as we saw in the book of Acts, from that place they went. They went into the surrounding community. And there are these three overlapping circles that you're drawing. Yeah, and so... When I look at this phrase, we talked about the three words, the believers together, one place. And I'm thinking of just trying to put that into a picture to help me to better understand this. So what makes the believers believers is the gospel. And so I would put that in the first primary circle there, the gospel. Yeah, that's good. When Jesus asked his followers who they thought he was, Peter piped up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's the gospel, is that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Absolutely. The gospel is everything. But the next thing that I see is the togetherness. Mm -hmm. And togetherness, um, in my mind, is the relationship, the fun connections that we have with the people in the church. Yeah, yeah. Such a huge part of actually being a part of a church community is the relational aspects of it. And then the third word that kind of sticks out to me is place. Mm. And the place is like a location. Mm. And that's what I would fill into that third circle there, so location. It's good, so we have these three intersecting aspects of being a follower of Christ. There's the good news of Jesus, there's the relationships that we share not only with God but with each other, and then there's a location in which we experience all of this. Yep, those are the three components of yeah. the phrase that we've been examining together. But the other neat thing is that when the gospel intersects with relationship, I think we talked about and agreed together that that's where discipleship that's starts right. to happen. That's right. 
So that was Jesus. Jesus' command to his followers was to go and to make disciples, other followers of Christ. And that happens in relationship with each other. That happens. And we, we use something called the one-to-one, which is you know, a simple way to begin to learn the very basics. And then we also have the growth track, which is our four simple steps so you can get connected not only in relationship with God, but you can connect, get connected to life of the church. Mm-hmm. And then there are other things. Um, There's like serve teams. Yeah. I know that I've grown in my relationship with God by giving of my time, volunteering of my time through serve teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Because relationships, they have to be forged. Unfortunately, they can't be built just from a distance. they got to be up close and personal. Serve teams gives us that opportunity. Yeah. And then there's, there's small groups. We have them all in different places across our city where people gather together, not only to study the Bible, but to engage in relationship. And when there's relationship and there's a Bible, then there's discipleship that happens. Exactly. That's the discipleship component. When relationship and location intersect, uh, to me, that's kind of where fellowship can start to happen. Yeah. Fellowship. And I, and I like what that word really means. And it sounds a little bit stronger than the word fellowship, but that... That word fellowship, it really means a shared life. It's a shared experience. It's people who, like you read from the book of Acts, they were sharing their resources. They were breaking bread. They were having meals together. They were spending life together Mm -hmm. in um, real time in a place, Mm -hmm. right? In a place. Yeah, the place enabled the fellowship because of the relationships that were already there. Um, So you mentioned gathering or the idea of gathering. Um, Fellowship is also where celebrations can happen. Uh Uh-huh. And what I love about this property that we are at the edge looking into is that the person who was the architect who did the remodel in 1998, his vision was to create it as a place where the community could gather. Mm. It was created for that idea of creating a beautiful environment where people could experience a shared life together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can think of a lot of just fun memories at the Willows, and I think a lot of us have those same experiences of celebrations, dinners, family gatherings, friend gatherings, just all of the fun stuff. Um, and so that is a lot of the fellowship component. Yeah. And, and it's such a beautiful environment too, and such a different environment for a church mm. that it, it makes it a little bit more um, enjoyable invitation mm-hmm. for a child mm-hmm. to invite their classmates or for a parent to invite their friends or for somebody to invite somebody to mm-hmm. come to church yep. because it's not your typical gathering space. Yeah. It's not your typical fellowship yeah. space. I think it's somewhere where we can all be proud of. We yeah. can all be proud that we have some ownership on this property and it's a lot easier to invite someone to a place that we're not only proud of but also a place where we all happen to be already familiar with yeah. we don't have to send them google directions to find this place for the first time they've already been here now we can invite them to the same place but now it's them in, uh, being invited into our home yeah, that's really good it's super easy access coming from east or west or in town it's just right there. Yeah. It's within stone throw from the University of Hawaii. Right. So, yeah. University of Hawaii, there's also that brand new dormitory building yeah. a couple of blocks around the corner. So we've got fun, gathering, celebration, all making up fellowship. And what just came to mind was our chili cook-off contest. Yeah. Imagine having that in the courtyard <laughs> of the Willows. Um, I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. It might even change the quality of the chili <laughs> that we <laughs> make. Yeah, oh, that's overnight. right. So that's... The intersection of location and relationship yeah. and then lastly where location meets the gospel when location intersects with the gospel i think that can be a platform from which we can serve the community so yeah. i'm going to put here service that's good that's such a it's such a great word because that's the reason for which jesus came right that is the gospel meaning a location jesus lived in real time and he said he didn't come to be served but he actually came to serve and give his life as a ransom mm-hmm. so we follow our savior to do that same type of thing mm-hmm. yeah and thinking of what it looks like to serve the community even in this environment with coronavirus i know that our sister church Pearlside, they turned their campus into a food distribution center and so i think we could very easily do that and that's the kind of thing that our church has had a harder time with not having a permanent location right. from which to serve the community but we see that happening in churches across the world right now is they're launching yep. services to the community providing meals at a time like this yeah that's right um, i think another thing that you had mentioned in the past is using this property on a monday through saturday basis 
just for the people, the community um, classes. So I don't know, classes could be things Yeah, like and that's one of the difficulties right now is because we don't have a place. Well, number one, you guys are watching us from a, the other side of a, of a screen, which is okay, we're glad you're here, but we really would rather have a place where we can gather together and a place from which we could serve the community, not just on Sunday for those moments that we're there, but throughout the week, mm -hmm. right? Where we could actually enhance a family's life by mm -hmm. providing them some of the services, some of the resources that they may not have access to mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Financial education, marriage education, even tutoring for their children, uh, different things that the church can provide. I'm even thinking about those who are business leaders or aspiring to be business mm -hmm. leaders. A lot of people just don't aspire to it because they don't have the resources mm -hmm. to actually be able to achieve that. Mm -hmm. But what if we taught them leadership? What if we opened up our space and mm -hmm. invited people in and went to the community and taught people how to lead, how to build a business, yeah. those different type of things that we typically can't do from the spaces that we've been in before. That's right. This gives us that opportunity. Right, right. We could be a resource to the community, but we could also do fun stuff like you could teach us ukulele lessons. Yeah. <laughs> and singing lessons singing and any lessons, other of my yeah. many talents. Yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. I'm, my grandma was part of the Mungo Gardens community senior citizen group. And so on Wednesday, she looked forward to going to play mahjong with her friends at the community center. That's they right. enjoyed meals together. And I could see very easily there's a world of possibilities when we think of the community service programs mm -hmm. and classes and meals that we can provide to the community from the home base of the location yeah. and being inspired by the gospel. Yeah, no, that's so good because the gospel is all at once spiritual and it is as well practical. It's not either or one or the other, it's both and. Mm -hmm. And this gives us an opportunity to make a real practical as well as spiritual impact in the lives of people in the community. And yeah. so we gather together and then we come into our community. Mm. And we open the doors to our community and we're able to invite them in yeah. and join together with us. That's a great vision. Yeah. So just to review, we have the gospel intersecting with relationships. Mm -hmm. We talked about that being discipleship. Yeah. Relationships intersecting with location, that's a place where fellowship can happen. Right. And location inspired by the gospel, that intersection is service. It's a place from which we can launch services into our community, into yeah, our neighbors. Yeah, that's right. Because as we're building better citizens and getting the gospel inside of people, we're also building a better Oahu mm -hmm. and a better community. And so so let's let's do this thing. You know, I've had this... This, uh, this picture in my mind comes from the book of Ezekiel. Mm. And in the book of Ezekiel, there is a picture of the temple of God. And then from the temple of God comes this river. And the river is representative of the Spirit of God that comes out from the temple. And the river comes and it flows into the desert. And then eventually it flows into the Dead Sea. Mm. And then along the way, the river that comes out of the temple, it brings life to everything it touches. So mm. along the banks of the river, there are trees sprouting mm -hmm. up. And this vision that Ezekiel has of even the the fish and the ecosystem being brought to mm -hmm. life. And that's what I see. That's yeah. what I see for the church. Yeah. That's what I see for this location and the importance of it in connection with the gospel and relationships is that from this place we spill out into the yeah. community, we spill out into the world, and the power of the Holy Spirit begins to bring life mm -hmm. to the things that it touches. Yeah. Yeah, that's who we're called to be as a church. Yeah. And here's one more thing I wanted to point out yeah. here. So where discipleship and service and fellowship intersect like you said that is our church that's grace that's who we're called to be and i really also think that that is the heart of god mm. right in the center yeah of everything that we just described that's right so that's why we believe that our next step to continue being this multiplying multi-generational multi-ethnic multicultural movement on a simple mission of taking this good news into the world into our community that's why we believe our next step is securing a location from which we can not only gather in which not only can we gather but from which we can go mm. into our community and world. Yep, well said. Yep. And all the believers were together in one place. They met together in one place. Clifton, thank you so much for putting a visual on our vision. And when you, when you look at that vision, when you think about it, when we detail what it might look like for our church, it's all at once exciting and it's dangerous. And I, I like that. I like that because I believe that our God is a dangerous God and that His church should be dangerous. Dangerous in a good way. Dangerous in that we are making an impact in our world and in our community. We're not just living in our own bubble, but we are spilling out into the world and we're making an impact. 
And I, I want to encourage you, you know, during this, this time when we have all these different things going on around our lives, the temptation is to shrink back, is to shrink your God, and is to play it safe. And, and I know because I succumb to it in, in different moments of my life as well. But I want to encourage you to rise up and be the dangerous Christian, be the dangerous follower of Christ, be a part of God's dangerous community, His ecclesia on the move that He has created us and He's created you to be. Not to shrink back though and just play it safe. That, that's not how God changed the world. Jesus didn't play it safe by sparing His life. He actually made a dangerous and risky move. He gave His life. And the followers of Christ, they gave their lives, they lived their lives, and they did everything they could to continue to follow in the steps of our Savior who is good, but he's dangerous. And the church is good and it's dangerous. So thank you for considering with us the importance of having a location for a church because a location gives us the opportunity to gather, to grow, and from which to go. We believe that God wants us to gather, to worship him. We believe that as God's people grow together, we become a place where his presence dwells. And as we go together, we become in our community the light that we were created to be. And we bring blessing to our community. We bring blessing through the good news of Jesus Christ. He is the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the savior of the world. And there is peace with God through him. Look, let's do this together. Let's be a dangerous church. Let's be a people who step out of safety into the dangerous place of following our Savior. I know many of you right now, you are, you're struggling with fear. You're struggling to stay in that place of safety. And I want to encourage you, just like God called, Jesus called to Peter when he was in the boat and there was a storm all around them. And Jesus called Peter out of safety onto the water. I believe God's doing the same thing with us. He's calling us as individuals and as a church to step out of that place of safety into that place of danger. But here's what we know. In that place of danger on the water, our Savior is there. Peter was in the safest place, even in the midst of the storm as he walked on the water because he was with his Savior rather than in the comfort and the safety of the boat. Whatever your situation, whatever your circumstances, God has provision for you in the midst of it. And He wants to provide not only His Spirit, but He wants to provide what you need so that you have the courage and the confidence to step out of the boat into the place where our Savior is, that dangerous place where God wants His church to be. The church is a movement. It always has been. It always will be. It was people who were gathered around this single event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were going on this simple mission of taking the good news, this simple message that Jesus is resurrected. He is the Christ. He's the son of the living God into all the world. And I want to invite you, church, I want to invite you to pray with me as we ask God for the courage and for the strength, for the faith that we need to follow him into this dangerous place so that we can fulfill our purpose. Our purpose is Grace Honolulu, our purpose as the church in this city. Father, we thank you for your spirit. Lord, you said that you would give us power by your spirit so that we could be your witnesses not only here in our city, but in the outer cities, Lord, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So Lord, I pray for our church and I pray for you, that you would have the power of God. Can you just ask him for it? And just receive from him, God, I need your power. And I need the faith and I need the courage and I need the strength that comes with it so that I can be your witness in my city and in the world. And so Lord, we thank you that you are good and Lord, you are good and dangerous in a good way. And Lord, we thank you that you have called us to follow you into all the world. We're gonna do it. Let's do it together, church. Let's do it together. Some of you, maybe you're hearing this message for the first time. Maybe you didn't really know what Christianity was about. I sure didn't. When I was growing up and going to Sunday school, I thought it was, you know, just taking a list of good and bad and do this, Greg, and don't do that, and following these rules. And what I found over the course of time, when I was 20 years old in particular, it dawned on me that this was really about a relationship with the living God, a relationship that was made possible because Jesus stepped out of the comfort of heaven, out of the safety of heaven into our dangerous world. And he experienced the full brunt of danger. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. And he died in our place to pay the price for our sins so that you and I and anybody who calls on his name could have peace with God. 
not just in the moment, but eternal peace and wholeness with God. And if you've never started a relationship with Christ, if you've never received the peace that He alone offers, I wanna invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. It's just a prayer that comes from your heart, expressing your desire to be in a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. If that's you, please pray with me and just say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on a cross in my place to pay the price for my sins. I believe that you were raised from the dead by the Spirit of God. Today, I ask you to forgive me, and I pray that you would fill me with your Spirit and make me brand new so I can follow you. Out of fear, out of just safety, into the safe place of your presence. And help me, Lord, to be a person who shares my faith with others all the days of my life. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Amen. Man, if you, if you said that prayer for the first time, God says you are a brand new person on the inside. Now, I gotta be honest with you. When I said that prayer, I didn't feel anything different that night. But over the course of time, as I took steps to get to know this God, I began to feel something different changing inside of me. My perspective changed, my heart changed, and all the things that I didn't understand before, I began to understand over the course of time. It was because now I had a relationship with God. And if you just said that prayer, you just started a journey, a relationship with the living God. And we wanna help you take your next steps. So we would like to give to you some free resources that you can use to take your next steps in, in knowing God. And to get those resources, all you have to do is text the word new start to the number on the screen below. Now look, this, this moment of worship, we're gonna just enter into this moment of worship as we just celebrate. And if you just said that prayer, this is your opportunity just to begin to celebrate. And I know it's kind of awkward, but you can just begin to do this, just begin to thank God for what he's done in your life. And if you didn't say that prayer for the first time, but you've already said it, I want you to celebrate along together with those who just said that prayer for the first time as we declare how great our God is. Let's worship Him. Yes, that is who our God is. He is good and following Him is the greatest adventure in this lifetime. 
And we're glad that you're along with us. We want you to, we, we want you to be with us next week. Uh, one of the things that people have asked me and when I've told them about the location that we are trying to take possession of together, they've asked me, well, what does this mean for me and how can I be a part? How can I be a part of Grace Honolulu in making this thing happen? Next week, we're going to talk about that. So please don't miss it. You want to hear it. You want to be a part because together we're going to follow our dangerous God into this beautiful future that he has for us as we take the message of Jesus. Christ on mission into all the world, and we make a difference in our community. Have a great week. We'll see you next week as we gather online. God bless.